Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love and kindness. We just want to praise you, Father, for all that you have done, for your amazing works. As we come before your throne, Lord, and as I stand in this pulpit, Christ, may you be represented. May the message come straightly from your word. Around there are immortal souls. The Savior is unseen. The Holy Spirit broods over the congregation. Angels gaze upon the scene. And heaven and hell awaits the issue. Dear Father God, we pray, Lord, that your will will be done. We pray that souls may be saved and lives may be touched. And um, thank you for the opportunity for just working through a vessel. Lord, we give you thanks, and may you receive all the honor and glory. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Uh, a pastor and his wife and his son, they had been to a shopping mall. The boy was badly misbehaving. He was whining for this and whining for that, running off, etc. As they were driving home, the boy could sense his mother's displeasure and said, Mother, when we ask God to forgive us when we're bad, he does, doesn't he? She replied, yes, he does. The boy continued, and when he forgives us, he buries our sins in the deepest sea, doesn't he? The mother replied, yes, he does. The Bible says so. The boy was silent for a while, and then he said, I have asked God to forgive me, but I bet when we get home, you're going to go fishing, aren't you? <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I think that some people have the gift of forgiveness, and some have a harder time in forgiving others. Some people get angry, they blow up and get over it. For me, I don't get angry very quickly. I just, it just sits and it cooks with me and simmer for a while as time goes along. And I just get even. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm the person who holds a grudge and I can hold it for a long time. I know none of, the, <laughs> I know none of you don't go through this. I'm, maybe some people are other church, but not in this church. I know that. I don't say this out of pride, but I see that it is a sinful behavior that I'm working on. But to hold a grudge and a malice is not a good thing. It makes you bitter, if you have, to live with it. I can still remember vividly my daughter, and she's no angel, she's here, she can testify that. My daughter, when she was trying out for her high school soccer team as a freshman, she was doing very well, and some of the girls were jealous of her and started rumors about her. The rumor got so hurtful that she came home crying. And then she was sharing some of this with me as we were driving to her soccer practice. As a dad, that didn't sit very well with dad. I was getting angry. Then as we approached the soccer field, she said, Dad, there are some of the girls who have, were spreading rumors among the other girls. I said, do you want me to go up there and take care of business? She said, no, dad, no. It's OK. Then she went out the car and said, by the way, these are not the real names. Hi, Judy. Hi, Carol. And she walked with them to the soccer field in laughter. I sat there and I marveled. Little did she know that she was teaching her father how to forgive others and not to hold an offense. Matthew 18, 21 through 35 says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he had 
and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you have owed. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved, and came and reported to the Lord of all that happened. Then the Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you plead with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord was moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. One pastor, friend of mine, he says, Forgiveness is like acid, which d destroys the vessel in which it is stored more than the object upon which it is poured. I'll say it again. Forgiveness is like acid, which destroys the vessel in which it is stored more than the object upon which it is, for. it is poured. Are you an unforgiving person? Or do you find it hard to forgive others who have offended you? A man was telling his friend about an argument he had had with his wife. And he commented, Oh, how I hate it! Every time we have an argument, she gets historical. His friend replied, You mean hysterical? He said, No! I mean historical. Every time we argue, she drags up everything from the past and holds against me. Sometimes I... I find the same in my, own lo in my own life. And I can remember when the pastor said to me, Michael, you must forgive. Forgiveness is the oil that keeps the machinery of marriage flowing smoothly. Little did I understand the power of those words. And I would be the one who would be the one who is historical. Well, my wife would be hysterical. I remember sitting in Pastor Hart's office when he said to me, Michael, if you have forgiven someone, then you need to forget. I said, Pastor, I have forgiven. But as for the forgetting, it's just hard. It's just hard. He said, if you have truly forgiven, you need to truly forget. That means you don't talk about the wrong that is done. You don't bring it up again. Peter said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against and I forgive him? Now, Peter was being nice. He was being kind. Because in the rabbinic teaching of the day, three times was good enough. Okay, someone sins against you, you should forgive them three times. Peter was being nice by saying seven. Now, I kind of wonder about that three-time rabbinic teaching because you know what? Is it three times in one day? And what do you do after the third time? Now, Peter being nice said seven. Is it seven times in one week? Or is it seven times in one day? Because, you know, some of us need a whole lot of forgiving. Peter was being generous. But Jesus was saying, forgiveness needs to be exercised at a much greater extent. You see... It is not 70 times 7, which is 490 times. Jesus is actually saying, you don't keep account of forgiveness. But we should always be forgiving and forgetting. Those who are washed by the blood of Jesus should have a forgiving heart. I'll say it again. Those who are washed by the blood of Jesus should have a forgiving heart. Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, once reminded, was once reminded of an especially cruel thing that had been done to her. 
her friend said, Miss Barton, I seem to recall what this person did to you, her friend said. Clara said, no. I distinctly remember forgetting it. You can't be freely happy if you harbor grudges. So put them away. If you want to collect something, collect stamps or collect postages. But if you keep remembering the things that people have done to you, you will forever be down. Jesus completed the idea by giving a parable. And Jesus is the master of parables. A parable is a story that is thrown alongside. The word para means alongside of. You know, you've heard about the paratransit. Well, it comes alongside of those who are taking or those who take the transit. It's para. So it comes, it means alongside of. He gave the story of a king. This king was very, very wealthy. As a matter of fact, this king came to settle an account. If you look in your, um, if you look in the passage, it says there was a king who came to settle an account, and there was a servant that owed him ten thousand talents. Now, let me tell you what that is. You know what ten thousand talents? You know what that is? One talent is equal to 15 years of labor. That's one talent. 10,000 talents is equal to 150,000 years of labor. Let me say it again. Okay? One talent. You have to take 15 years to pay off one. If you owe 10,000, that's 150,000 thousand years of labor verse 25 but since the servant didn't have the means to repay the king the king commanded he and his wife to be sold and payment to be made now you know we, we see exactly what sin can do this is what sin can do to us if we're not careful in making godly choices in our lives Sin can sell us out. It can sell us. Not only that, it can sell our children, ultimately, our relationships. Once, one thing that really, that really bothers me right now, I think about a person who I've looked up to, and that's Bill Cosby. And I see exactly what he's going through because of the sins of the past. Sin will sell us out and put us into slavery. Sin can compare to getting a credit card without having a job or the resources to pay it back. You know, getting a credit card. But thanks be to God that we have a, a bank in heaven so that when we sin, he can cover it. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God that he has this vault, this wealth in heaven, so that when we sin, oh, we'll never fall into debt. Verse 26, the servant fell to the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now, this is ridiculous. Because in verse 25, it says that the slave did not have the means to repay his Lord. And he and his family was about to be sold. If you look in verse 25, it says he didn't have the means to repay him. But the Lord saw the servant's heart, and he felt compassion and forgave him all that debt. Isn't that something? When you and I, when we come to Jesus Christ, regardless of whatever you and I have done, he is willing, able to forget all, forgive all that we have done. And by the way, if we could itemize all that we have done, we would never stop. If we took an accurate account, we would never stop. As a matter of fact, we see if we go back and look at that king, the king didn't really know how much that slave owed him until he did an audit. And the amount was unimaginable. The servant fell to the ground, prostrated himself, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And the Lord, verse 27, 
And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and forgave him all that debt. Isn't that something? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice for those of us who have a credit card and we can't pay it? For the, the credit card, so it's taken care of. Don't worry about it. But I'll take your card, though. <laughs> I'll take your card, just in case, so that you won't do it again. You know, when I look back at this 150,000 years of labor, 10,000 talents, that's like having a mortgage. Student loan, for those of us who have been to school and we have to pay it back. Bills up front, and it's taken care of. And we have, and we still have 150,000 years a bonus money to spend. Ain't that something? Some, one writer says that's like having 60, 60, 60, let me get this right. Mathematically, I'm challenged sometimes, okay? But let me get this right. It's like having 60 million dollars plus. Now, you might say, no, that's not much now because you probably can go through a million dollars a day the way how we are. But back then, that was a whole lot. Verse 28. We see the word but. When there is a but in the scripture, it's a contrast. Verse 28. But. And that's a major contrast. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. 100 denarii. Now, 100 denarii is equal to $42. <laughs> This amount is about three months' wages. And look what he did. He seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. Very interesting, the language. He grabbed him by the throat and choked him and said, Pay back what you owe. My, my, I can't believe that. Are you seeing this? This guy must have had some kind of amnesia. He was just forgiven. 150,000 years of debt, now he's choking a guy who owes him $42. You know, that's how it can be with you and I. Someone has done us wrong, and man, it's hard. For, as a matter of fact, we hold a grudge against them. We can't forgive them. So his fellow slave fell to the ground, and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me. Wait a minute. That sounds familiar. Have patience with me, and I'll repay you. These were the very same words that this slave had uttered in verse 26 to the master. But he was unwilling, verse 30. He was unwilling, and he went and he threw him into prison until all was paid. But you know what? God is watching. God is watching. God is watching. Verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and came and reported all that had happened to their Lord. Then summon, summoning him, his Lord said to you, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should not you also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Here, Jesus in the parable was reiterating the principle that we should forgive others because God has forgiven us. Jesus is reiterating that we should forgive others as God has forgiven us. As a matter of fact, we see that in the Lord's Prayer, which is actually, it's not, called, it's not the Lord's Prayer, it's the disciples' prayer. Because it says, and forgive us of our trespasses. Jesus didn't have any trespasses to forgive him. But it says in the disciples' prayer, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. His Lord was moved with anger. And he handed him over to the torturers until he should repay him all that was owed him. I always wonder what the torturers were. Who were the torturers? Sometimes, you know when you're in debt and you have those, they used to, they're called the collection agency. Remember those guys? By the way, did they, I think they had some law that stopped them, right? Did they still... The, the torture is the collection agents. They call you right before dinner. 
you owe so and so and so and so. I know a lady, she's pretty good. She goes, it's dinner time. Give me your number so I can call you on your dinner time. Very interesting. It's funny, but it's not. Because I can still remember my grandmother. My grandmother's name was Sister Pearl. She had 19 kids. I don't know how she managed it. 19 kids. At her funeral, she had 70 grand, 32 great grand. But you know what I remember about, more about Sister Pearl? None of her grandchildren would visit her, except for I, I did. And then I come to the realization why no one would visit her. Because when she was visited, she would tell them all the stuff in her life, everything. Tell them how her marriage was, tell them that she didn't want to marry this person. And she, by the way, I was held captive. Not only that too, I'm a grand boy, so I better behave myself. Sat there, I was her audience. And I would listen to her over and over and over and over again. My cousins, they didn't visit her. Okay? But here, you could tell that all the things that had happened to her, she has not given it up. She would keep repeating it over and over again. As a matter, I could see that she was bitter. Very, very bitter. Forgiveness can be a very hard thing, which doesn't come easy. Are you bitter? You know, many of us have been hurt. We have been hurt from our childhood, could be suffering from bitterness. Some of us have been abused. Others, we have given our love and our hearts to others, but it has been trampled on. And hate and remorse sets in. It's hard to forgive. As a matter of fact, only God can help us to forgive. If you're like me, you ain't going to forgive. And worst of all, you might forgive, but you know what? You ain't gonna forget. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh, yes, I see you show up. I remember what you did. And I can become very historical. I didn't study history for nothing. For some reason, it just clicked very quickly. <laughs> clicked very quickly. As I shake your hand, oh, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, I remember what you did to me. Why are we like that? And some of us, we just forgive and we go along. It's hard to forgive. I'll give you a secular view for psychology. The process of forgiveness has been shown to have both psychological and physical benefits to the person who is doing the forgiving. Who is doing the forgiving. Shocking, isn't it? You may have heard the old axiom, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Now, thanks to recent research conducted by venerable psychologists, there is a clinical proof that non-forgiveness is bad for you. By the way, this is secular psychology. Dr. Fred Luskin, in his book called Forgive for Good, a proven prescription for health and happiness, notes that the results of his and other scientific studies show that people who are taught to forgive become less angry, less angry, more hopeful, less depressed, less anxious, less stressed, more confident, and they learn to like themselves more. Now, sometimes I kind of wonder about that because the first, thing I, the first person I like is myself. I don't have a problem liking myself. Okay? If, if there is a, a directory taken and there are pictures, the first per, when I go to the directory, I look for, not you, I look for me. I see what I look like. Not only that, if I go to a buffet, guess what? What can I, what's nice for me? So therefore, with this pop psychology sometimes about learning to like yourself, I think they got it all wrong. Moving along. Would you like to have less anger, depression, and stress in your life? Would you like to be more confident like, to like yourself? Forgiveness is the answer. Some prelim preliminary words. Forgiveness is a process. It's not an event. If someone has deeply hurt you, you may find it difficult to forgive quickly. Although it is possible 
to be able to forgive immediately is my personal goal. Believe me, I am not there yet. You may not even be aware of people or situation that you need to forgive, but their memories may be festered in your cellular tissue. Now we're talking about now, we're going right into, into the medical part of it. In your cellular tissue, unconsciously depleting your energy and vitality. As you become aware of these issues, practice these steps to lighten your energetic load. What are these steps? Step one, identify exactly how you feel, write extensively and expressively about the situation, the personal event. Sharing your deepest thoughts, emotion, and needs. Many spiritual teachers understand that the power of writing, okay, helps your feelings and more and your emotion and your brain. Step two, talk to a trusted friend or a partner or advisor about the subject. This is an important step to help you fully identify and, and acknowledge the emotion. Step three, consider and write about the situation from the other person's point of view. I don't know how to do that. If you did me wrong, I don't know how you feel. I just know how I feel. Okay, but they're saying that you should do that. Write from the other person's point of view. Step four, consider and write about the situation in the third person as if you were a newspaper journalist. Can't touch that. Step five, construct a forgiveness letter. Okay, that sounds pretty, pretty reasonable. Construct a forgiveness letter to the person who aggravated you. Acknowledge the emotions that person have felt, their needs, what elements and background, and so forth and so on. Step six, decide what actions you will take, whether it is legal action or conversation with others. And step seven, your brain has been trained to tell your grievance a story about the situation every time you think about it. So therefore, stop doing it. Stop doing it. That's from a psychological point of view. But let's go to the spiritual part of it. If you like chocolate chip cookie, raise your hand. You ever wonder what's in the ingredients of this stuff? Let's examine it. A recipe for chocolate chip cookie. And think about it. It's good, right? You like It's pretty good, right? Okay, watch this. Eight tablespoons of salted butter. Can you imagine? Eat, would you eat butter by itself? No, you wouldn't. I don't think so. Half a cup of white sugar. Okay, I think I can hang with that a little bit. Nope. Half a cup of, dark, of light brown sugar. I can handle that. One teaspoon of vanilla. That by itself is, eh, I don't think I want to go there. One egg. That by itself, I don't think so. One and a half cup of all-purpose flour. If you're eating flour, something is wrong with you. Half a teaspoon of baking soda. And if you're eating baking soda, something is seriously wrong with you. Half a teaspoon of salt. Three-quarter cup of chocolate chip. Mmm. Preheat in the oven, 350 degrees, microwave. You ever think about sometimes the stuff that happens to you that it's, it's not quite nice, isn't it? Think of yourself as a chocolate chip cookie. Let me give you one example. Think about Joseph. He's a chocolate chip cookie. He was loved by his father. That's a good thing. That's good. He was a dreamer. That's a good thing. He was hated by his brother. No, that's not so good. His dad bought him a nice coat. That's good. Obedient to his father, to finding his brother. That's good. His brother's thrown him into the pit. That's bad. He was sold into slavery. That's bad. He was bought by Pharaoh, by Potiphar. That's good. He resisted Potiphar's wife. That's good. She seduced him, and he fled. That's good. Where did he end up? In prison. That's not so good. In the end, he ended up to be the prime minister of Egypt. 
You see, God can take the bad things of your life and he can preheat it in the 350 degree oven and he can mix it and he can beat it and it can be battered and God can make a beautiful chocolate chip cookie of whatever you're going through. God can do that. But it's only God who can do that. But we have to learn how to forgive. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. I believe forgiveness is one of the hardest things in Christianity. Some of us are not wired to forgive. Mm -mm. And if I bet if I would have an individual interview with each and every one of you, you could point out someone who did some wrong to you. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And let's look at Joseph. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 20. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 20. Turn to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis 50, verses 15 through 20. Now this is Joseph at the end of his life. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full all the wrong which we did to him? Now these are the brothers now. Joseph was prime minister. These are the brothers who had taken this young man, thrown him in the pit, and sold him off to the Midianites. Oh boy, man. Ooh, I'm prime minister now. And seeing the, oh, ooh, gee, this is nice. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God your father. And Joseph he wept, and he spoke to him. And his brothers also came, fell down before him, and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. I'm going to say that again. As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. Dear saints, whatever you and I are going through, whatever turmoil it is, however someone has wronged us, you know what? And I can't say that it's God who has allowed this. I can't say that. I'm not in that position to say that. But I can say this. God wants you to forgive. God wants you to forgive. Whatever the struggle is, whatever the pain is, whatever the abuse is, whatever... It is that's in your crawl. God wants you to forgive. I told you about my, my grandmother. And sometimes I think it's a generational cycle of sin. Because in my own life, I have seen stuff that I need to forgive. 30 years. And it still bugs me. And I have to say, Lord, you need to help me because I can't do this. You need to help me. I can't do this. I need you to work through me and forgive. Because I know who I am. You know who you are. And you have seen, and sometimes you relive, sometimes, by the way, the brain is weird. The brain will go back and access information that has happened in your youth and bring it right back in your present. And you're thinking, and you say, hmm, what was done to that person? Only God alone can forgive. And boy, we need God in our lives to forgive. As I come to the end of the sermon, who are the torturers? The torturers are when we don't forgive. You ever see people, how oh, they're so miserable? Oh, there's angst. I used to work in a nursing home. And sometimes we wonder how some people are so miserable. And, and it's like, 
And you're like, what happened in their lives? You made them so miserable. And then you find those who are so sweet, and so they're just forgiven. When you forgive, I believe the Spirit of God that helps you as a Christian to forgive, it gives you that peace that surpasseth all understanding. But when you don't, the torturers, the tormentors are there. That's the reason why some people get sick because of the stress, because of the malice, because of the grudge. Those are the torturers. But thanks be to God that he gives the power and the ability to forgive. Ephesians chapter 4, as a matter of fact, Psalm 32, Psalm 32, turn there with me, Psalm 32, Psalm 32 says this, you probably might find it before I will, Psalm 32 says this, How blessed is he, she, whose transgression is forgiven. How blessed. Whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man or the woman to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And whose spirit there is no deceit. David, and by the way, this was a sin after Bathsheba. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My, vi my vitality was drained. Away with the fever heat of summer. But when I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity, I did not hide. When I confessed my transgression to you, you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Believers, we need to live a life of forgiveness. Not three times, not 70 times seven, but to have a forgiving heart. We need to practice this forgiveness. I believe sometimes God's, the work of God hand is stayed because we have so much bottled up unforgiveness in our heart. And when we forgive, we will see the work of God, how it's flows so smoothly and if we can forgive which we cannot we go to him as a Lord give me the power to forgive but then there's another thing what about you who don't know Jesus Christ your personal Savior what about you if you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ your personal Savior it's not good it's not good at all as a matter of fact you're feeling the tortures and it will even get worse it will even get worse but Jesus Christ he came and he lived a perfect life and those who didn't like him they put him on the cross and you know what's interesting while he was on the cross he looked at them and said father forgive them for they know not what they have done father forgive them for they know not what they have done father forgive them for they know not what they have done. In the same way you and I, we must always call out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they have done. And you who do not know Christ right now, you need his forgiveness. You need his forgiveness. It's kind of funny, um, I was talking to Pastor Hart, and you know, he, he was downstairs, and he was, he was just talking to me very casually. Of course, that's, that's his mannerism very lightheartedly. And then he, he shared a psalm, I mean a hymn, hymn 122. And then I was looking through the words. And it says in verse 1, why did they kneel him to the Calvary's tree? Why? Tell me. Why was he there? Jesus, the helper and the healer, I like that. Because boy, I need some healing. Jesus, the helper and the healer, the friend, why? Tell me why. Because all my iniquities on him were laid. Everything you've ever done. And by the way, this is great because it, it's past, it's present, and future. Isn't that something? It's past all that you've ever done in the past, and it's the present, 
and the future. Jesus, the debt of my sin fully paid, he paid the ransom for me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to come to him now. Don't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow is not guaranteed. You need to come to him now. Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for forgiveness. Forgiveness is only of God. We can forgive, but it's only so short. And we're asking you, dear Lord, that you will empower us, enable us as Christians to forgive. For those who don't know you as their personal Savior, help them to see that they need your forgiveness right this moment. Help them to see that they need you. Father God, we just thank you and we love you. May you be honored. May you be glorified. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.